from replicating conventional deposits to real profit, take, uh, profit and loss sharing. Uh, the main topics of this session, core principles of governance of investment accounts, the role of different organs of governance, overview of the main governance challenges and issues, the need uh, robust risk management, the need for robust risk management framework and effective monitoring mechanisms, the importance of transparency and disclosure to maintain trust and uphold Sharia principles and rules, and Last, lastly, the role of regulators and standard-setting standard bodies in developing cons consistent management frameworks. Uh, this session will be chaired by Mr. Farooq Raza, Governance and Ethics Board uh, member, AUFI, and Group CEO of IFAS UK. Please, uh, please sir, proceed to the floor. Uh, the panelists are as follows. Sheikh Dr. Muhammad Qasim, Sharia scholar and Islamic banking expert, chairman and member of the Sharia boards of several Islamic banks. He is based in United Arab Emirates. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Burhan Arbuna, EVP, head of Sharia compliance at Salam Bank, Bahrain. And Mr. Lilian Lul Falher, executive manager, Head of Treasury Capital Markets, Kuwait Finance House, Bahrain. And last but not least, Mr. Ali Sharif, Ali Sharif, Islamic finance expert, Bank du Liban, Lebanon. Please, sirs, proceed to the floor. I just want to remind that the session is starting now, 11.10, and it will end, supposed to end by 12.10. Thank you very much. They say it's the same. So a lot of people, you know, they say it's the same as conventional. This is, a, you know, something that I hear so frequently from people, you know, who are uh, part of the industry, from the consumers and, you know, from, uh, you know, the competitors as well, the researchers or whoever. Now, whether Islamic finance industry is the same or not, is a different you know, debate. I don't want to enter into that debate today. We want to focus on one thing, and that is the similarity of the products, which is sometimes confusing people, thinking that you know, the beginning of the product is the same, the end result is the same. So what's the difference between conventional and Islamic? So a deposit is a deposit, you know, a finance or a loan is you know, the same thing and so on. However, when it comes to investment accounts, this is something that nobody, not a single person can argue that it's the same or it's similar to a conventional product. Because this type of product simply does not exist at all in conventional. So it's investment accounts, they are very, very unique to Islamic finance industry, but they also seem to be like a problem child, right? Because a lot of people, especially the regulators, they are struggling to figure out, you know, whether to treat this product as a deposit or as an investment. It has, you know, features of both. And it's very difficult actually to place it, you know, or you know, to box it in, into, a, into a certain category. So, today's focus is on, you know, investment accounts, how they are different or how they are similar, what are you know, the, the specific features and why those features, they require a different approach towards managing these accounts, these products and also the governance of these products. It cannot be the same in my view at least. 
let's hear from uh, you know the the esteemed panel that we have so i will ask first of all brother ali sharif uh, to do his short presentation and that will be to set the scene you know about the regulatory view of investment account and then we will take the you know the discussion inshallah forward from there thank you okay bismillah rahman rahim in our discussion uh, we are tackling as our colleagues uh, will be saying that this is the one of the main important topics in the field of islamic finance which is investment accounts the controversial debate concerning investment accounts stems back to the beginning of our industry. At the beginning, we had many points of view concerning this topic. Some people were against the naming of the investment account as part of mimicking conventional finance. But mimicking was not the most ideal term to be used, we have to admit. But at that point, at the beginning, back in the 60s and the 50s, it was the way to penetrate the market. We wanted to start penetrating this industry. As our knowledge accumulated, as our knowledge developed, as we grew more and more as experts in the field, we can say that now we reach the point of development of Islamic banking and finance, targeting the future of Islamic banking and finance, which must depend on innovation, technology, and building a solid trust in the market. The trust is based on governance. The better the governance we provide, the more the participants in the industry will trust what we are doing. Based on that, I will go to the ultimate goal that we see ahead of us nowadays, which is to reach Islamic banking and finance products that aim at economic development based on sustainability and eco-friendly, green finance. We have to admit that the challenges we are facing nowadays based on the last five years of crisis that we've been facing is how to be up to the expectations in this industry. Our expectations to be met should depend on providing necessary tools for economic development based on sustainability and green finance. How is that related to our topic investment accounts? Investment accounts are the tools that can be used if well managed and well treated to provide such developed and such uh, services that will meet this target. I will just discuss here the, or highlight the effort being done at IOFI level and the effort being done at the IFSB level. Cons why I'm focusing about those two main institutions? Because to us in the industry, those are the two main wings that will take us to the future. The changes we are making are based on the challenges we are facing. Changing is not a shame. This does not mean that what we used to do before was wrong. What we used to do before was exactly the suitable thing up to our level of knowledge at that time. Especially, I'm, I'm tackling the high expectations we have on our brothers as Sharia scholars. They are the main building block in our industry. They are becoming more and more experts in finance and in fiqh al-mu'amalat. That's why we depend on them in providing us with the Sharia underground or the Sharia infrastructure in order to reach our targets. What's going on now at the IOFI level is briefly revisiting the two standards, the FAS 27 and the FAS 21. Our target or the target of IOFI, we all consider IOFI as 
uh, our second house. So we all, uh, we are always proud of what we do at IOFI as working group members or board members. So revisiting FAST 27 and FAST 21 will lead to the emergence of five standards kind of to replace those two previous standards. <clears throat> we will be dealing with the control of assets and businesses, the quasi-equity including investment account standards, the off-balance sheet assets under management standards, the transfer of assets between investment pools standard and the promotional gifts and prizes standards. After finishing the workshops and finalizing the Sharia review of those five standards, we can say that we took the standards related to investment accounts to the new level based on the emerging challenge of dealing with investment accounts from the control point of view. This is what we have now as the main path to the future if we want to reach investment accounts or take investment accounts to the second level. Based on this, we have to discuss the governance key players or mention the main governance key players when it comes to this topic. We cannot ignore the importance of the Islamic Financial Institutions Board of Directors, the Sharia Supervisory Boards, the Investment Account Holders, the Regulatory Bodies, and the Internal Sharia Auditors. Each one of these participants or players has its designated role and importance. If they work in harmony together, we can reach the level of governance that we expect to make investment accounts in their new version trusted instruments by all the participants in our industry. In order to better understand this, we have to simplify what does Islamic governance mean and how does it differ from the typical conventional corporate governance models. We can simplify it by saying that conventional or simple formula saying that corporate governance general stakeholders model, if added to Sharia compliance, added to additional fiduciary responsibilities and dynamic developments will lead to Islamic governance. This will highlight the uniqueness and the importance of the Islamic governance. To me, it depends on two main factors in this formula, the Sharia compliance and the dynamic development. Development is dynamic in Islamic finance. As our life gets more and more complicated, we will be facing more and more challenges that should be dealt with, with changes to adapt with these challenges. Based on an infrastructure laid down by the Sharia compliance so that we stay on the right path. To conclude with, the effort being done, whether with IOFI or IFSB, highlighted the main principles of governance for Islamic financial institutions or Islamic banking. I will highlight the fourth point in front of you, which is to manage cyber risks, climate-related financial risks, sustainable development risks. The challenges we are facing should or forces us to take into consideration governance regulations that will give trust to participants and to investment account holders when it deals with how to manage cyber risk. This is a risk we cannot avoid anymore. We have to mitigate it properly. We have to manage it properly. Climate-related financial risks is the next kind of risk we have to learn how to manage, along with sustainable development risks. All the other principles will be integrated in the new standards that will be issued by IFSB or IOFI as the necessary tools in order to lay down the 
proper infrastructure that is to manage the governance when it comes to investment accounts. My colleagues now will highlight the practical sides and the Sharia approach when it comes to this topic. Thank you very much for listening and hope we will continue with a fruitful discussion altogether. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Ali, for a very insightful uh, presentation and also keeping to your time. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you know, I have a couple of uh, questions that I will come back later to you. Sure. Uh, but once uh, you know, we go through all the panelists, inshallah. So um, the next uh, uh, esteemed speaker is uh, Sheikh Muhammad Qasim. Um, obviously, you know, um, representing the Sharia scholarly community. Um, you know, again, as I said, it's, uh, you know, investment account is a problem child for many. Um, how do the Sharia scholars see this, uh, you know, from a Sharia perspective and especially this, uh, you know, allegation of uh, mimicking, you know, how we can address this, you know, through investment accounts. So if you could please uh, share. Yeah, you, you, can, you can run it from there or there. But, yeah. Okay. <coughs> The topic is investment accounts from replicating conventional deposits to real profit and loss sharing. The first issue is whether we are replicating conventional deposits or not. This is a question and replication means creating a copy, whether it is an exact copy or a close copy. We all agree that there is no intention on the part of the Islamic banks to copy conventional banks. But under the prevailing circumstances, there is no doubt that for a variety of reasons, the bankers try to give to the customers in the market something resembling the conventional products that they are after. So we cannot deny this fact that there are similarities and these similarities have created a lot of question marks about Islamic banks, Islamicity. We face these challenges in our in different countries and particularly where a large number of Sharia scholars are not uh, satisfied with the present model of Islamic banking. So we should agree that we have problem areas and that these problem areas where we find true replications or which meet the purpose of Islamic banking need to be addressed holistically. And for this, I think we have a lot of reasons, Sharia arguments. The first one is that if you mimic haram, it will lead to haram. Man bi fahuwa minhum. Then definitely in all our endeavors and our activities, the net result is very important from Sharia point of view. ma'al. What you get at the end of the day, what is the result? And then, mashallah, the speakers before me, they all spoke about the maqasid of sharia. So, atibar al-ma'al is very important when we decide about the sharia compliance of a product. We all know also that there is a huge difference between what we say, what we stipulate in our agreements and what is practiced. Legal hair splitting means nothing when it comes to practice. At the front desk, the guy who is sitting over there and talks to a customer, he is more important, I think, in many ways than a Sharia scholar sitting somewhere or Sharia department and documentation doing something which is never read, which is never <clears throat> understood. The words of the front desk staff of a bank represent the true nature of Islamic banks to the, to the customer, to the public. And unfortunately, I have heard myself 
people coming to me saying that the staff in the front desk they say that it, there is no difference between conventional banks and Islamic banks. The staff sitting in a branch of Islamic bank. So definitely there is a perception and there is a need to change that perception. Even if we are not wrong, even if everything is right in place, so there is something I think we have not been able or we have not been capable of uh, conveying the right message. So what are the reasons? We have to remove those reasons. So since we are talking about the investment products, the issues on the deposit side, as uh, Brother Sharif said, the problem starts with how we look at the deposits, whether they are liabilities or investment accounts. So far, they are considered by a majority of the regulators as liabilities. Uh, presently, I think IUF standards, accounting standards, they identify them as, as, as quasi-capital, uh, but not as capital. So this issue has to be resolved. Uh, investment account holders, they feel that their money is guaranteed. They will lose nothing. And if they lose, they have a right to come and claim, claim their money back. They don't know that they have invested their amounts in businesses of the bank. They feel that there is a cash deposit in, in the bank that they are entitled to get it at any time. And regulators or regulations help them or help building this kind of perception. Sharia scholars have traditionally ignored the accounting aspect, but now I think Ayufi has taken the lead and we have to resolve this as a matter of fact from the accounting perspective. We all know that in Islamic banks, there is a practice of, practice of calculation and distribution of the desired rates. There is something they call it desired rates. So it means that the actual profit distribution and calculation means nothing. What is the desired rate? They want to reach the desired rate and there is a kind of a reverse engineering. Weightages and profit sharing ratios in many places are manipulated by frequently changing them. And this is one of the basic conditions of uh, Sharia compliant mudaraba. In uh, Sharia compliant mudaraba, the profit sharing ratio should be known. You cannot change it unilaterally. But unfortunately, in, in most of Islamic banks, it is done with a notice period of three days or, or seven days or even 15 days. And the majority of the depositors know nothing about it. Or even if they know, they may not have any choice to change or to go to another bank. Banks get higher profit rate, high net worth customers because of the weighted system, they get a higher rate of profit on the at the expense of the low net worth customers. So weightages either should be <coughs> removed or they should be made logical and should not be allowed to be changed frequently or arbitrarily. There is a lack of regulatory limit on mudarib share. Mudarib in, in some banks, they, they get whatever they want. They just say that we've we feel that we should be entitled to 60, 70, 80, 90% of profit. Now that, that gives a lot of leverage to the bank. Combined with HIBA, HIBA, general HIBA, and in certain cases in money banks, there are tier specific HIBA. So you give the perfect tool in the hands of the bankers to give, to commit a rate and to fix the rate of profit. So, this is a practice that we should stop or phase out gradually. The rate commitment with all these tools and leverages, we have given the bankers the, the, the perfect tool to fix rate. And when they fix rate, that is riba. It is not Hiba, it is Riba. And Al Mahmudu Kal Mashrood, and I have seen particularly uh, recently with the uh, interest rates 
skyrocketed in certain jurisdictions. The quoted rate was higher than the actual profit generated by the pool. So if, if there is a quoted rate of Wakala, for example, say seven, the actual generated profit, because the repricing comes at a later stage, it takes from six to one month for the bank to catch. Bankers know uh, the regulators. So if you have a rate, a quoted rate, and the customer has the right to come and claim that it means that you are paying from your pocket not even from the incentive so you have committed a rate and that rate is in my view riba particularly when the customer has the right feels entitled to that rate and has the right and comes and takes that money from you and this is i think now the practice or in all wakalas in wakala with the combination of incentives to the wakil as good performance incentive and also the right of giving hiba rate fixing throughout uh, you find that people get the quoted rate and even in many cases they have thrown out of the window the profit calculation module and policy and etc etc because they never give more than the quoted rate and never give less than that so we have all we are as a matter of fact instead of creating more distance, running away from the conventional model. We are closing the gap and getting closer and, and closer. And I think once you blur the lines, you fall in the pit. And that is the, the, the conventional uh, model. So what is the way forward? We must emphasize that there must be real profit distribution with a full paradigm shift in Islamic banking. And that comes only when there is a holistic view and effort for change of the entire paradigm. If you run Islamic bank, banking parallel with, with conventional banks, this problem will never go away. So in jurisdictions where Islamic banking is the only choice or is the dominant choice I think we can start from there we should also start uh, putting all these funds off the balance sheet whether it is the common mudarba pool wakala pool or whatever the deposits investment accounts should be off the balance sheet not on the balance sheet these are not assets of the bank these are assets under the management of the bank so we, we as uh, Islamic bankers, we should depict the real picture. We should not say something which is not correct. When a, an Islamic bank says, these are my assets, I think it is not a correct statement. We, we must put limits on the leverages of the bank that lead to rate fixing and paltry profit payouts, especially to low net worth customers. We need a lot of how we can get there. Islamic banks should focus on Sharia training of their staff, particularly the front-end staff, limit the discretionary powers of pool managers that allow them to manipulate the weightages, enhance Sharia compliance in environment and Sharia audit. Central banks or regulators, they should uh, work on, on, on these standards, on on asking Islamic banks to run these funds as off-balance sheet funds. They should increase awareness of the masses. They should increase checks on Islamic banks. Customers, they should also embrace Islamic banking if they really want Islamic banking. They should be ready to uh, incur any loss. They should get higher profit. There must be a a marked difference between Islamic banks and conventional banks. They should not go uh, and, and shop for uh, banks. And they have their, in, the, in their list a number of conventional banks and Islamic banks and they will just choose the bank of their choice which gives them more services and more money. No, it should be Islamic banks or something halal, Sharia compliant, and conventional banks something off the table. 
Jazakumullah khairan. Thank you very much. I hope I have not crossed the line. Thank you, Dr. Kasim. Uh, the next, I would uh, request uh, Sheikh Muhammad Arbuna, who is a very active Sharia scholar, uh, sitting on many uh, Sharia boards. And I'm sure, Ya Sheikh, that you will be uh, experiencing, you know, these challenges on, you know, on a daily basis, where, you know, there are, uh, uh, you know, these situations where, uh, you know, a hiba has to be given or not to be given or uh, you know the profit calculation is 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 it accurate is it in accordance with the you know the iof uh, principles and rules is it according to you know the standards is it according you know to the accounting standards and so on and so forth so please enlighten us uh, you know uh, out of your experience how do you see this uh, issue of investment accounts thank you okay i wanted to thank you very much i wanted to sit here and talk but i find myself that i have to stand on the podium Fuddle, please, thank you please Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Salatu wassalam ala ashraf al-anbiya Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Actually I have to respect my scholar, my teacher Dr. Muhammad Qasim When he seeks to speak I have to stand that's why I have to be here. Uh, actually, I will take another direction, uh, different direction from his uh, presentation. And before I do that, I would like to thank uh, IOFE and also ISDB for giving me this opportunity to contribute to this topic. Of course, as the presenter said, this topic, uh, we have been on the field for about 20 years. Almost every quarter, we have to review the financial statement before it goes to the public. Uh, this is the central bank's requirement for Sharia compliance. But before I do that, I have found that the topic that we are asked to talk about, which is uh, profit sharing uh, contracts, moving from replicating conventional banks that this topic is very dangerous in terms of the topic itself and we have been hearing this to depart from replicating conventional deposit taking to profit and loss sharing mechanism when one pounders on this statement it appears that the outcome of the claim or appeal is that Islamic banking deposit are copy paste of the conventional bank's deposit mechanism. And we certainly know that conventional deposits are classified by IOF standard and economists at a large as loans. So when you said we have to depart from conventional deposit to profit, it means you are saying the current status of the Islamic banks, they are doing loan-based transactions. So you are calling them to depart from that. And this is, this is giving a very dangerous uh, implication, which means you are telling the public, look, your Islamic banks, actually they are not Islamic banks. So you can deal with conventional banks because they are the same as conventional banks. This is the implication of this statement. Therefore, we have to be very careful on this kind of statement when we are doing it. Actually, the reason, the fact that we have a certain product and we have to put certain parameters to make it Sharia compliance, that does not mean that we are replicating. When the Prophet, may peace be upon him, came to Medina, he saw that Salam was in practice. The Salam was in practice. He didn't change Salam. He didn't say, oh, you have to change Salam, do it this, or throw it away. He just put certain principles to the contract of Salam, and it goes. And this is what all our scholars are talking about. When you come to a public, and you find that people are doing something, you have to make sure that you try your best to accommodate what they are doing. 
We cannot invent the wheel. We cannot say, okay, we have to push all these conventional transactions and other things and bring new ones. But we can put certain conditions and, and go forward. This is introduction. But for me, from a topic, topic point of view, I don't see an issue of profit sharing mechanism. My issue is how to make these investment accounts resilient, sustainable for both the account holders and the bank. This is a very important topic. It's not whether I have to, okay, we, we push, we move from conventional to profit sharing, and so what? I give you profit, 10, 10, 10 BD or 100 BD and so on. This is not the issue. The issue is how far I can make these accounts sustainable, resilient, very attractive to the, to the account holders. So I put some issues. For the past so many years, we used to believe, and if you look at it, when it comes to zakat, if you ask anybody, do zakat on your accounts, account, uh, savings account or so on. The people will say, okay, that zakat, you have to put all your money that, that is in the account as part of your zakat, uh, zakat calculation, which is not the case. If you look at accounts, investment accounts, you can see that they are shareholding in the company, they're in the bank. It's a shareholding. We tend to believe that it's like a cash. So if it is a cash, I have to get my cash back plus, plus something. These are not cash. Once they go into the bank, they become asset. So asset, as per, uh, as per all the scholars, that you can trade them. So this is what we are talking, trading of investment accounts, how we have to do that. So when it comes to HIBA uh, incentive, or withdrawals, what the banks are saying. The banks are saying, okay, if you give me the money for the investment, whether it's Wakala or it's Mudaraba, and you come in at any time, you want your money back. In order to give your money back, I have to go and find liquidity. I have to go and find liquidity, and then give you the liquidity, and then you go out. That liquidity, I don't have it, but I can make it from my pocket. So what the banks are doing, actually they are not paying you money cash to cash. What they are doing is that they are selling, they are purchasing your ownership from the account and then giving you whatever. And, and this, is, this is actually exactly what the IOF standard says. IOF standard did not regard uh, uh, accounts as cash. In account and uh, uh, standard number 40, distribution of profit in Mudaraba based investment account, it is permissible for the account holder to exit from the Mudaraba with all his funds or part of them. Such exit represent the desire of the account holder to redeem his share in the Mudaraba asset of the account holder without withdrawing the total amount. And at the end of the clause, it says, this is depend on supply and demand. It's a supply and demand. So what the bank is saying, when you want to break, I will give you 100 minus 20. So 80 is my purchasing price. 80 is my purchasing price. Or even I found out that some scholars are even going further. Fiqh is going further to say, if the accounts, if you, if you stop your account, you can negotiate at, what price, at any price that you want to sell. At that time, the bank can decide to pay the account holder its money plus a profit because it's, it's buying, the, it's buying the, the goods, it's buying the asset of the client. In order to make this trading possible, we need to create market makers. The problem with uh, breaking charges, HIBA, and other things is the bank is taking the advantage. So in order to make sure that the bank is not taking advantage, we have to get a third party. A third party that is there still can purchase that and then 
uh, and can purchase the, the account holders uh, uh, business and then he goes out without having to lose some money. And then I brought in some issues that are, I consider it, if you put it in a place, the Mudaraba and investment account holders are more resilient than credit or Murabaha. The scholars have put certain parameters around this contract to the extent that the capital, uh, the, the, the Mudarib cannot play with the money of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the account holders. One example to end is for a long period of time, we have believed that the Mudarib is not responsible if the accounts make losses. It's not responsible. The capital provider has to provide an evidence that he has done something wrong. But as scholars going on, they are seeing this is not resilient. It's not sustainable. It's not making investment accounts sustainable. And recently, Alhamdulillah, uh, uh, International Fiqh Academy issued, uh, issued a resolution that the owners of proof that I will make losses and that loss is beyond my control is on the bank. The bank has otherwise the bank should guarantee the payment of the capital. And now this is what, what, what is going on. IOF is standard also in many places in irrigation in Keda. It brought a mechanism to make sure that the Mudarib, which is the bank, is not playing with the money of the account holders. And it says what? It says you have expenses. Sometimes the bank can play and say, okay, all these expenses is against Mudaraba portfolio. The IOF standard in irrigation uh, standard and other standard says you can agree that all the expenses that has to be charged for this business, for us, for the, for the, for the, for the, for the Mudaraba pool, it will not go beyond certain threshold. If it goes beyond certain threshold, then you, the bank, you will be responsible for that. In, in the irrigation standard, it says even you can agree that all the expenses on the Mudaraba pool should be borne by the bank, by the bank. This is one thing. The second thing that we are not looking into, Mudaraba is not only deposit taking, it's also investment to finance uh, other people. I am trying to... Now, when you come to profit distribution, yeah, profit distribution, you see weightages, what the banks are doing in their weightages, what we require as Sharia scholars and all the Sharia scholars, is that the weightage should be brought before the Sharia board in the beginning from the in, from the beginning from each change of the weightage the principle is that you have to have approval of the sharia board that this is the weightages i'm going to use now if you are violating that weightages it's not a problem of the sharia board or anything it's the problem of uh, regulatory issue it's a regulatory issue regulators should put in place or it's an audit issue and then I end up with, the, with saying that for me, in order to make accounts resi uh, resilient, I'm seeing that for the accounts, the Islamic bank should show that this money is going into uh, developing SMEs. So we, we judge the performance of the bank by how many small and medium Corporates, they are able to bring to the next level. The performance, the performance of the bank, the central bank can put, okay, I want to see, you got the money of these people. Some of the money is free of charge, like current accounts are free of charge. Savings account, the reason sometimes the banks are giving small portion of profit is because of the regulatory requirements. They are saying, okay, Regulator, regulators are saying, okay, I should not invest 100% of this money. I should put some liquidity. But when I'm giving the profit, I have to give profit on the 100. If I take 100, 90 is the investor, 10 will go for liquidity. But my profit distribution will be on the 100. This is one thing. The second thing is that the regulator is saying, 
any toxic asset, any bad asset, you, the bank, you are going to be responsible for it. If you are talking about Mudarba, Sheikh Qasim says the, the, the customers are willing to take this risk, then it's fine. But the central banks, because they have to manage the economy, they don't want people to come and start crying that, okay, this, our money is getting lost. We have to put Mudarba into banking perspective. We have to put these investment accounts into banking. Central bank is saying, okay, this you cannot. You have to take the risk. So the bank is saying, I'm taking all this risk. That's why I have to give some, some small profit. But if he's willing to share and he will lose all his capital, then there is no problem. Thank you very much, Sheikh Arbuna. Jazakallah khair. Uh, very insightful indeed. Uh, now, I think we have two slightly, you know, different, uh, you know, views. Um, let's go to uh, someone who will probably be able to resolve the riddle for us. Um, someone, you know, who is, uh, you know, in the kitchen all the time and is a very, very seasoned Islamic banker. So, my friend and brother Lilian, please. So tell us, tell us what happens actually behind the scenes. I'm not putting any spotlight on your bank, but generally speaking on the industry. Yeah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, in the dirty kitchen, actually. Um, I think first, uh, I'm very, before saying what I think and what's going on in the kitchen, as you said, I really want to, to thank uh, Sheikh Mohammed uh, Qasim for his presentation. I think, I mean, I've been through, I don't know, 10, 15, 20, 30, whatever, panels uh, discussing this kind of issue, so-called controversial issues, the, being the Tawaruk, being the investment account, being are we replicating or not mimicking, whatever. And I think it's the first time I see someone having the courage to say what's going on uh, today in our industry. So really, thank you very much, Barakalofik. Um, because and I'm not, we're not going to try to blame people or to try to find who is responsible for it. I think we are probably collectively responsible of what's going on. And what has been described in the first presentation of Sheikh Mohammed is exactly what's going on today. Today, uh, we, we are, and uh, I mean, I think to start with, actually, um, the headlines that uh, Sheikh Arbona took some time to, uh, I mean, to dispute or to, to disagree with, uh, is, I think, a symptom of what our industry is. If the LOP, which is one of the uh, main pillars of our industry, is putting this sentence a bit provoking, uh, it probably means something. It probably means that there is an issue. Um, today, um, s stating that uh, from replication to uh, real profit sharing uh, implies that we are replicating today what, uh, what commercial banks are doing and that we would like to move to something else. And I think the second part of the statement might be wrong, is that I agree with the first part. We are replicating, and I will come back why we are replicating what's going on with conventional bank, but I don't think we are really willing to do uh, the second part of it, which is going uh, to real profit sharing. Uh, because we are talking about two different animals here. Uh, the main issue, I think, to start with is that I don't think we should call any bank, Islamic bank, uh, a bank if we really follow what should be our principle and what should be the DNA of Islamic banking, which is profit sharing, we should be called Funduk uh, rather than a Masraf. We should be called really a fund, an investment fund, and sharing the profit with our customer. Now, the, the question is, when you look at the DNA of Islamic finance, any book, we had a couple of books I've been presented this morning, any book, any AOF standard is insisting on the, the importance of profit sharing. The, 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 the AOP standard number 30 on, the, on Tawaruk, for example, clearly states that Tawaruk should not be used unless of case of an emergency and that banks should go after, I don't know the exact wording, but should go after investment accounts. But the reality today is that if we want to be mainstream banks, if we want to compete with our, uh, with our conventional bank competitors, we have to be able to offer the same uh, type of product. And quite often we are using uh, the concept of the rura, the concept of necessity, uh, to justify ourselves or to give us good conscience 
of doing products who are very close to what a customer uh, uh, find in, in conventional banks. You name it, credit cards, uh, overdraft for corporate banks, and we'll always hear an internally discussion, debate, sometimes people will be, will be against it, but at the end we will approve these products because we'll say, okay, we have to. And, and really I think I want to, I, mean, I don't want to enter into details and technical aspect of the, of the presentation of Dr. Bona, who mashallah went through the details on how we use the hibba and all this, but at the end of the day, it is true, we do have as bankers, as you say, Shah Mohammed, uh, we do have the tools uh, to I mean, manipulate is a bad word, I mean, put uh, some kind of negative, but at least to adjust, let's put it this way, try to be more, uh, um, try to be more um, neutral. Uh, we have the way to adjust the profit. Diplomatic. diplomatic yeah. I'm, I'm French, so it's difficult to be diplomatic, but <laughs> I'll try to. Um, and to be diplomatic means, um, I mean, we really have to question ourselves collectively. In this room, and I, will, I would probably not speak like this if it was uh, an audience, a different audience, but in this room we are all bankers, Islamic bankers, and I'm pretty sure that most of you, 90% of you, if uh, if we have a one-to-one -one discussion, you will probably agree with the presentation of Shah Mohammed, at least in some parts and majority of, of it. But I think collectively we are a bit afraid, and for one simple reason, I go back to the main point, it's, it's all about customer centricity, and all about what we want for our industry. Do we want our industry to be mainstream and compete with all banks? And in this case, we'll have to continue to mimic and to replicate, or do we want the Islamic banking to be a niche market uh, sticking to the to the Sharia principle despite whatever the customer wants because at the end of the day I don't think we I mean I'm biased obviously saying that but I don't think we should we should uh, blame the the bankers the bankers don't come in the morning and say you know what I want to do Tower of today the whole day because that's what I want to do and I want to blame the Sharia scholars either I think it's collectively where I think in our subconscious is telling us that if we stick to our principle We'd probably be, uh, I don't know, 5% of the market share, or 2% or 1% in some country. Because the reality is that the society itself is not ready to accept uh, the principle of the Sharia uh, in Islamic, I mean, in finance. That's the reality of it. And even some people, and I probably put myself including, I mean, uh, if you start telling them you're gonna lose 10% of your profit because, Allah Ghalib, you know, we did some investment, we lost 10%. Here's your 90 dinars instead of 100 dinars, they will not accept it. And the reality is that 90% of our customers, I don't have any number, 80, 90, 95, 70, whatever, but the vast majority of our customers are agnostic, being Muslim or not, and they do not uh, care much about uh, the Islamic banking principle, but they look at you and compare you with other conventional banks. And uh, the vast majority of our customers, when it comes to deposits, which is the topic today, will compare your rate with the rate of a conventional bank. The conventional bank will go as per the interest rates, uh, which are skyrocketing nowadays. And as an Islamic bank, you have just, I mean, the alternative for you is either you follow these rates and you use the tools that Sheikh Mohammed described, the Hibba and trying to pro profit equalization, reserve, whatever. You use this tool to match. Uh, otherwise, your customer will go to the Ribawi bank uh, because it's just looking for a return and a rate. Similarly, on the, on the asset side, it's not the topic of today. So I think really to, to conclude, I just want to say again, it's a collective question we have to ask ourselves. Is it customer first? I mean, customer centricity is a big theme nowadays by all regulators. They want us to be customer centric. If we are customer centric, we have to admit that, again, the vast majority of our customers are looking for capital protection, and stable return, which are in contradiction with what an investment account should be. Um, I remember in 2006 or 2007, uh, KFH uh, Kuwait, actually, our head office, uh, paying 7% on an investment account, and that's the only example I have in mind of a real investment account. They pay 7% when the Bible at the time was 4% or whatever it was, but much more because they truly share the profit of the of the bank on that year. It was a one-year account, and you are completely blind. There was no even uh, a rate, a target rate being given. It was just paid at the end of the year as a percentage of the profit of the bank. And when it comes to, um, to, to, to this investment account, is either we go and we, 
really call them investment accounts, but today the reality is that they are treated on the liability side. They are treated as part of the deposit, and, uh, and the regulator is looking at it for the vast majority of them as an on balance sheet deposit uh, for, for the Islamic banks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lilia. That very interesting and very, you know, highly appreciated, uh, you know, for your transparency and for the honesty. I think uh, the problem is pretty clear. It's, uh, you know, a collective responsibility of uh, everyone from the industry, whether it's the regulators, whether it's the practitioners, whether it's the Sharia scholars. And, uh, you know, when we put the responsibility, we usually name, you know, these three stakeholders. We actually ignore the fourth stakeholder, who is probably the most important, and that is actually the consumer, yeah, the customer himself or herself. And unfortunately, you know, it has been mentioned many times you know, this morning that, uh, you know, people are not prepared. And why they're not prepared, I think that begs a different debate altogether. I would have loved actually to continue for maybe uh, the rest of the day at least. Uh, but I have been informed by uh, the organizers that we have to, uh, you know, end the session. However, um, I would uh, give the opportunity to the, the audience for asking just one question quickly. Okay, many hands. Okay, two questions and two veterans of the industry. So please, uh, Professor Kabir. We'll keep it short. We really need to close it. Thank you. Well, uh, you know, this argument that you have made, you have been made, I mean, for the last 10 years, the same thing. The question is, of course, we know we want to do Islamic finance. So you have taken a model in the Islamic banking similar to conventional, why do you expect that to be different? So given this, either we discard that model, start something new or non-banking financial, that's a better way. I'm a little bit surprised, the Sharia scholars are fighting and trying to make this, uh, you know, this model Islamic banking more Sharia compliant, profit sharing, it is not possible. It's conceptually not possible. So why the Sharia scholars are not raising voice against this model itself, that generates all the problem. I just want to know, it puzzles me, it puzzles me too, because you cannot do, because in a, first of all in dual banking system, and you have taken a conventional fractional reserve banking model to do Islamic finance. It is not possible from the conceptual standpoint. But why the Sharia scholars are not raising that voice against this model itself? Sorry. Well, I, I guess you, it was a I mean, you, you look at me, so I guess no, the question is for you. It was a rhetoric question rather than a rhetorical question rather than a, a true question. I mean, the, the why, I don't know the why. Is just, I think it, it goes back again to the same, what I, I mentioned is it's being a niche market versus being mainstream. If you want to be mainstream today, I s certainly believe uh, deeply that the society, the vast majority of the society is not ready to accept a profit sharing, pure Sharia compliant model. Uh, we are dead based. Uh, from grade one, you learn how to compound interest. I think our, our, our brains have been brainwashed and, uh, and we, are, we are, as you said, I mean, if you want to do pure financial intermediary, uh, debt-based, and you want to be competing with a conventional bank, uh, you will have to adapt yourself uh, to replicate, to mimic whatever you, word you want to use. Uh, and uh, and if you, on the contrary, if you want to be on the pure profit sharing model, which I've been hearing for the last 25, 30 years, uh, then, then you put yourself on a very niche market. Uh, thank you. So, I'm not a sure. So, sorry, Professor <laughs> Kabir. So, Professor Kabir, sorry. Uh, we, we, okay, we, we have to close this. So I, I'll just add one you know, sentence here. I think the answer to your question, probably, Professor Kabir, is were actually embedded in uh, Brother Ali's presentation where he said in his opening statement that we started from somewhere, this is the journey. The problem is that we have become stagnant, we have made our journey, our destination. We have to continue and this is where probably we will end up actually eventually, one day inshallah, I'm not sure whether I will be around or not at that time, but we will have to shape the industry in accordance with its spirit. The problem I see as a practitioner and Alhamdulillah have had a lot of exposure across the industry, is that the reality is that we as an industry we are afraid we are afraid of you know coming out clearly and you know strongly saying it is different and as brother mustafa ansari you know the secretary general of iof says that if it is not different then it is not islamic finance i think this is a very key point right we have i'll give you the example of 
15 years ago, nobody in the world knew anything about crowdfunding. There were no regulations, there was nothing. When I first time heard of you know, crowdfunding, everybody was laughing at, what is this nonsense? You know, it's not it's never going to work. Today, in less than 15 years, almost every country in the world has regulations, you know, about crowdfunding and it's working. The second example I give you is, is you know, the crypto, right? 10 years ago, nobody knew anything about crypto. It suddenly came and now, okay, not a lot of, uh, you know, countries, jurisdiction have done the regulations yet, but everybody is talking about it. And the reason is that none of them, both of them, you know, the crowdfunding and crypto, they have never claimed that we are the same or we are almost similar. No, they came out clear from the very beginning, we are different. And because they have shown their Mr. difference, Chair. they have brought the value out, the regulators, you know, the market have taken them seriously. The regulators have put the effort, you know, to bring out the regulation that is adequate for them, that is helping them, supporting them to grow. And we see the results. Mr. Chairman. Similarly with crypto. And now, you know, we for the last 30, 40 years, we have been trying to, you know, play around uh, diplomatically, as, uh, you know, Sheikh Kasim said. Uh, we are similar, same, almost, you know, this, not very far, blah, blah, blah. And mm -hmm. as a result, we are still we are running out of time. So I think no, we, we, to stop a we are running out of time. Sorry for, <laughs> thank so you. for that. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed. Thank you very much. And uh, okay. please, before. We'll take the questions offline. Please, I think please, the panel please will be have happy. it. Yes. Thank you. And, and before we, we have the 10 minute break, please uh, have the photo session. Uh, before we have the 10 minute break, uh, please join us in celebrating uh, two of uh, the MOU's agreements, uh, which we. Uh, today, earlier today, signed with uh, two of our stakeholders. Uh, for that, let me invite to the floor His Excellency uh, Sheikh Ibrahim bin Khalifa Al Khalifa, Chairman of Ayufi uh, Board of Trustees, and uh, we'll be starting with uh, one of our uh, partners one of the key stakeholders for Ayufi, Ahli Islamic. For that, I, I have the pleasure of inviting to the floor Mr. Mr. Salem, Yusuf Salem Rawahi. Along with Mr. Salem Rawahi, we will have I have the pleasure of inviting Dr. Muhammad Tahir Al Ibrahim, Dr. Abdul Rauf Tobi, Dr. Musa Al Azri, Dr. Mustain Abdul Hamid, and Azhar Hamid. Please, please grace us on the stage and join us in celebrating these two, in one of the two MOUs that we have already signed earlier today. So His, His Excellency, Sheikh Ibrahim bin Khalifa, Al Khalifa Chairman of Ayufi Board of Trustees, will be handing over the agreement that have been signed, signed earlier today to the management of Ahli Islamic Oman, represented by Yusuf Salem al -Ruahi. Thank you very much. And we look forward for an all beneficial partnership between Ayufi and all stakeholders such as Ahli Islamic and other stakeholders that have entered into such MOUs and agreements today, earlier today in the morning. Second, I have also the pleasure Uh, please, please join us in this, just two minutes, two minutes before we conclude, please. It's just two minutes and then we will have the break.
I would also have the pleasure of inviting to the floor Mr. Salim Al Mahrabi, Chief Financial Officer, Nizwa Bank, or Bank Nizwa. Thank you very much, and we look forward for all beneficial partnerships between Ayufi and the broader industry represented by the stakeholders that have attended this special ceremony. Thank you very much. Uh, we are breaking for 10 minutes, and we'll be resuming the session, the sessions today, after 10 minutes.